Good evening. Welcome to Illinois Law, presented by the Illinois State Bar Association. My name is Nancy McKenna, and I'm your moderator tonight for the program entitled Protecting Against Employment Discrimination. We have a very esteemed panel here tonight. To my far right is Kathy Pilkington, and Kathy is a civil litigator who concentrates her practice in employment and commercial litigation in state and federal court and practices in the Illinois De Department of Human Rights, the Equal Opportunity Commission, the Illinois Human Rights Commission. She is the continuing legal education coordinator and secretary for the Illinois State Bar Association Labor and Employment Section Council and the chair of faculty development for the Illinois State Bar Association Standing CLE Committee. She defends and advises employers on general employment issues, employee handbooks, restrictive covenants, payroll, overtime, and discrimination issues. To Kathy's left is Peter LaSorsa. He is a plaintiff's employment attorney concentrating in sexual discrimination. Pete practices before the EEOC the IDHR, the Human Rights Commission, and um, is on the Committee on Legal Technology, a member of the Illinois State Bar Association's Federal Civil and Labor Section. And Pete also lectures on four cruise lines and has lectured in over 30 countries. To Pete's left is, the, is um, uh, Danielle Gray, and Danielle Gray is the current general counsel of the Human Rights Commission as of May 2011. Previous to that, in June of 2008, Ms. Gray joined the Illinois Human Rights Commission as the deputy general counsel. Ms. Gray, previous to that, has worked as a legal writer and editor and practiced civil litigation in Illinois state and federal courts since 1999. Welcome, all of you, and thank you for taking the time and coming. Now, we're going to start with just, just the general question, and we'll start with you, Peter. What is employment discrimination? Sure. Well, thanks, Nancy. It's good to be here. First, in Illinois, employment discrimination is governed by the Illinois Human Rights Act. And there's, there's over 15 categories, if you will, of per different groups of people that are protected. For example, you're protected from discrimination due to age due to arrest record, ancestry, national origin, sexual orientation, sexual harassment, uh, a lot of various categories, gender discrimination. Also, if you report discrimination at work and you're retaliated against, so if the boss fires you or takes a negative job action against you, you also have protection and that would be called retaliation. And for people at work that are just in, a, in an investigation, so they don't have anything to do with the discrimination, but they may be a witness to the discrimination. If they come forward during an investigation and as a result they have a negative job action, they have protection in Illinois as well, and that would be called retaliation. Thank you, Peter. Um, let's see. Uh, what, what could an employer do, Kathy, to uh, expose themselves to a charge of employment discrimination? Oh, there's a variety of things. Uh, it actually starts long before a charge is ever brought when the employer is formulating policies. Uh, to like the employee handbook? An employee handbook or any general policy. When an employer enacts that policy, one of the things that needs to be done is equal discipline. So if you have a policy against doing or not doing something and two employees do it and one you discipline and one you don't you just set yourself up for a lawsuit that's one example there are a variety of things having a job description <clears throat> is an important aspect of this if you don't have a job description you try to leave everything very vague when you get that charge <clears throat> you are again you're going to be open to a lawsuit there's a variety of things. Once you get a complaint from an employee and you say to yourself, well, how about if I just transfer you to another department? Again, you just open yourself to a lawsuit. Well, why is that? Because the employer thinks they're taking care of the problem. They just don't want problems. Exactly. But here's the way the law works. When that person complains to the employer, 
the employer is now on notice. And that means the employer now has a duty to take an affirmative action to investigate. There's a legal duty to do that. By just transferring the person, it's almost like they're being punished. We have a technical term for it called adverse job action. But what the employer is going to run into is, because that person complained, you punish that person. Now maybe you, the employer thought they were doing the right thing, but that is not the thing to do. The thing to do is, now you've got to actually inquire, and you can't prejudge it either. You have to be very uh, equal in how you treat the person that's claiming harassment and the person that supposedly is the harasser. Is there a time requirement when you have to, the employer has to complete the investigation? There's no specific time requirement, but the sooner the better. And in completing the investigation, what the employer wants to do is, it, depending on the type of company, maybe go outside to get a professional to do it, because there's a lot of pitfalls in these investigations. When you go in to interview other employees, you cannot say, do you know whether X sexually harassed Y? You have to ask open-ended questions. Do you know of anything that's wrong? Anything in the work environment that, you, that you've seen? So, so it's very technical how this is done. And my advice to an employer is, the first thing that you need to do is pick up the phone and call and get some advice. And don't destroy or delete any records. That's another very important point that can also get you into trouble. You know, Nancy, one of the important points when you're talking about time limits, there is a time limit for the person that's being harassed. In Illinois, for example, if you're being sexually harassed, you have 180 days from the date of the last harassment to file a complaint with the Illinois Department of Human Rights or 300 days with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC. So those are very strict time limits. So if you were harassed a year ago and you didn't file with either agency, even if you have 100 witnesses and have it on videotape, there's nothing you can do regarding a sexual harassment claim in Illinois. So you have very strict time limits. So that would lend to the employer would have to perform an investigation or should it, uh, perform an investigation within uh, a strict time limit when it concerns sexual harassment. Well, here, here's the trick and here's what happens. An employee will be sexually harassed at work, report it to human resources. If they drag their feet and wait 200 days before they complete their investigation, the employee now hasn't filed with the Illinois Department of Human Rights. They've missed that window. So I've noticed that a lot of times employers will drag their feet, drag out the investigations, so that the employee then misses that time period. So it's very important that the employee contact an employment lawyer immediately, get their claim on file even while the investigation is taking place. That way they haven't missed that statutory time limit. But because very often I would, would imagine an employee would say, well, they're in, my employer is investigating and I told someone I trusted in human resources and they, they assured me they would investigate it and some people may have the mindset, well, let's see what the employer does about this. But your point is very well taken about not relying on the employer and being cognizant of your legal rights with the, the filing deadlines and getting legal advice. Um, now, let's say they, they meet their deadline, I and um, Danielle, and they, they come to the Illinois Human Rights Commission. What is the process? What would the employee encounter um, now that they're a claimant and they, they're going to file a charge? Right. Well, under the Human Rights Act, the process really begins with our sister administrative agency, which is the Department of Human Rights. Okay. That's where the, par the person would actually file a charge of discrimination. Is there any dual filing with the EEOC with the federal agency? They can't. A okay. person can dual file. They can file with the EEOC and have a dual file charge with the Department of Human Rights, the state agency. But they could also just do it singularly. That's with, correct. How do most people do it? Um, what I have seen is that people will often dual file. They okay. may go to the EEOC and, and indicate a dual filing with the department agency. And Peter, would you recommend someone dual file? What I always do is I dual file. I'll file with the Illinois Department of Human Rights as opposed to the EEOC, but I'll dual file with the EEOC. And here's the reason why. The Illinois Department of Human Rights is mandated to, to investigate the charge within 365 days, basically a year. 
Okay. The EEOC has no such mandate. So if you file with the EEOC, they could that file could sit on a desk for four years. Oh, that's okay. difficult for an individual. Right. Yes. So the only time I ever filed directly with the EEOC is if the people have missed the 180-day time limit because then I can't file with the Department of okay. Human Rights. So if it's been 200 days, for example, then I'm only left with the EEOC, so I'll file directly with them. So let's say the clock starts ticking, mm -hmm. Danielle. How... What is the process? Is there a fact-finding investigation? Yes, the Department of Human Rights, they conduct a full investigation, which includes having the respondent, meaning the uh, alleged offending employer, uh, respond to the charge. Mm -hmm. uh, they conduct a fact-finding conference where they have both parties actually attend and provide information to the department's investigators. Uh, and in that process, the investigators will basically gather evidence and they will attempt to make a determination of whether or not there's substantial evidence of a violation of the Human Rights Act. In terms of evidence, say the charge was um, sexual discrimination, uh, would they look at, would they require the, in the, the employer to produce data? Like they're not going to necessarily believe that they say, oh yes, we, we hire an equal number of males and oh, females, yes. but they would want some statistical information. Yes. Uh, show me all the people you've mm -hmm. hired in the last year. Is it typically the last yes, year? Yes, they can do that. They can ask for, they can ask for that sort of hiring data. Uh, they can ask, let's say it's a, it's a, it's a discipline issue. Mm -hmm. um, and let's say that someone is arguing that there's uh, discrimination on the basis of, of sex in terms of discipline. They can ask the employer to turn over records of discipline of male and female employees to make those sorts of determinations to see whether or not there's been a pattern of disparate treatment. Uh, in the different sexes. Now what about if an employer, um, are employers mandated to put sexual harassment training on? F are, are, is that something that's required or is that voluntary to educate their workforce on proper behavior in the workplace? Well it would be advisable to do that and I think Kathy can talk to you about that. They're not required by law to have training. They are required to have their posters up at work okay. uh, about sexual harassment and what to do if that occurs but it would be very advisable for them to have training and to have all their employees go through an employee handbook and, and know what their steps are if they're the victim of sexual harassment and let people at work know what could constitute sexual harassment so that they know that maybe if they make some comments or if they're looking at something inappropriate on a website that could rise to the level of sexual harassment in Illinois. Okay. Um, isn't there also something from the legal perspective for those of us as lawyers if they provide sexual harassment training can they raise an affirmative defense yes. to a charge? If they don't provide the training then they're not able to raise that affirmative defense? Yes. Okay. That's exactly how it works. Okay. And another important point for employers to remember, if the harasser is a manager or a supervisor, you've got absolute liability. So then you're, you're not going to have a defense, basically, if there's a finding. So it's, although it's... Even if you've done training. Even if right. you've done training. So although it is, it is extremely advisable to train the entire workforce, it is critical that you get managers and supervisors trained not only on to refrain from the type of conduct that's prohibited by law but um, also to make sure that they're when they're alerted to a sexual harassment complaint that something's being done about it right away. What about touching in the workplace um, like a pat on the back or a um, pat on the hand as reassurance is that something that's considered inappropriate in today's workplace? You know, I don't think that would rise to the level of sexual okay. harassment. You know, now if that was, if it was touching followed by comments, okay. then that could. Okay. But just a simple touching or a pat on the back, good job, um, I, I don't think that would, obviously. Now, if the boss only does it to women and is never touching right. men, and, depending you know, on the it, it depends on the circumstances. Yeah. But Okay, because some people are, are demonstrative, are... are um, reassuring or always want to do a pat on the back and, and um, it just depends on the circumstances if that's appropriate or not, if it's accompanied by something that's, that's not appropriate. Um, uh, what other types of discrimination seem to be very common that you see, uh, Danielle, before the commission? Is there anything, is sexual, is it racial, uh, is it national origin? What I've seen most have been race, sex, 
um, disability and uh, to a lesser extent sexual orientation. So those are some of the ones that I've been seeing most often. Okay. Now disability, isn't there a um, requirement for the employer to try to make a reasonable accommodation within a balance of uh, as long as it's not too burdensome on the employer? Um, there is. Yes. Yeah. And um, a lot of times it can be uh, just um, something as simple as uh, someone needs a, an assistive device, perhaps an amplified phone. Um, but if it's a small business, say a small pizza owner, that might be burdensome to that, that employer because of the cost and the, the number of employees they have. And well, you know what the cost of an, uh, an attorney is to defend a, a discrimination case? It's a lot more money than a $50 amplification for a phone, yeah. so they should probably Good point. keep that in mind. Good point. Another but, important point on disability discrimination is you only have to have one employee. A lot of these, you have to have a minimum of 15 employees for these laws to kick in. Okay. But uh, disability discrimination, one. Okay. Just yeah. one. Yeah. As well as sexual harassment, yeah. you only have to have one employee. Okay. That's important to right. know. Mm -hmm. That's important to know. Um, and, and you know, along the lines of what was taking place on categories, I noticed after 9-11 there was a big bump up in cases involving either national origin or ancestry. You had a lot of people from the Arab community that were being discriminated against, and there were a lot more claims coming in on that. So I think part of it has to do with um, what's happening in, in society at that particular time. Well, even today with um, new fall TV series, with the Pan Am series and um, all the press that the Playboy Club is looking for a location in Chicago, um, perhaps sexual harassment or, or sexual um, focuses might be heightened. Um, but to your point of it just depends what's going on in society. Um, the fact that we've been at war for 10 years, two wars, um, you know, uh, may lend still to some type of national origin discrimination. Uh, but um, what would you say, Danielle, is one of the best things that the Illinois Human Rights Act has done for uh, the residents of Illinois? Well, I think a couple of things. Uh, one is that it has added sexual orientation. Um, sexual orientation has been added to the act. It's been in, in the act for a few years. Uh, but it's one of the few jurisdictions in, this, in the country that act offers protection uh, for sexual orientation, which includes transgender. Okay. So for our audience, how do you define sexual orientation? Uh, sexual orientation, a person who's, well, it depends on heterosexuality or homosexuality, as well as transgender. Uh, someone who, for example, if you were born biologically male, but you uh, maybe through operative means become female. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Peter, what do you think the, the, the best development in, you would say, the last 10 years with employment discrimination, one of, one of the best Well, I, I think the Illinois Human Rights Act is pretty robust. Um, earlier this year, the legislature turned down uh, a chance to add to it with what was called a bullying law. Mm. Because, you know, it's... We've heard a lot about bu bullying. bullying. Yeah. It's unfortunate in Illinois, you know, as, as your employer, I could yell and scream at you and, and call you every name under the book as long as I didn't, you know call you a racial name or a religious name, but I could just, you know, I could call you, I could say you're stupid and dumber than dirt. And you have no protection in Illinois. You couldn't file a, a charge of discrimination against me based on that. And so, you know, we shouldn't let people treat other people like that at work, but unfortunately without that bullying law, uh, currently you could do that at work to an employee and their only recourse is to quit. So even though we have a very strong law, it could even be stronger if we would add that bullying law in effect. And hopefully the legislature will pick it up and, and add to it in the next year or two. Are there other states that have bullying as a protected uh, I, I believe category? there are a few that have that as a protected category. And now they're trying, the EEOC is currently looking at having uh, unemployed persons as a protected category. So if you apply for a job, an employer can't say, I don't want to hire somebody that currently doesn't have a job. Well, I have read in the doing. papers of late that, that uh, they have interviewed companies, and companies have said that your resume goes on the bottom of the list if you've been unemployed, mm -hmm. which is really discriminatory. It uh, is. People, someone that is unemployed needs a job. But there are, in fact, it has been reported that companies do do that. 
Um, and we're just looking for a fair shake. People should have a fair shake at a job. You don't yeah. be judged on their merits. Right. Kathy, wh what do you think, um, how have employers benefited from the Illinois Human Rights Act? Well, I think the biggest way in which employers benefit is the whole procedure is much less expensive than having to go to either state or federal court. The, within the Human Rights Commission, there are no depositions. One of the most expensive aspects of any litigation is the discovery process. Mm -hmm. In federal court, you have e-discovery, which is very, very expensive. Without depositions, it's uh, even small employers can go into the process. There is a settlement opportunity at virtually every stage so that the two parties can look at uh, how can we get this thing resolved. Now, I am absolutely opposed to Peter's point that we need to ha add anti-bullying to our statute because Illinois needs businesses. We don't want to be an anti-business friendly state. And having a job, being in the workforce, it's a stressful environment. There are many ways in which we can bring creativity and sensitivity to the workplace other than adding another thing that you can bring an employer into the human rights department for. Because it is an expense, and if we want small businesses to incubate and succeed in Illinois, we have to create some kind of a balance here between Yes, we want to be fair to employees, but we also want businesses to grow here and thrive here and succeed here because the two have to live together. So you would advocate rather than the bullying law um, as, a, as bullying as a protective category rather, you would advocate just sensitivity training similar to the education that's done with sexual harassment. Yes. So businesses would be encouraged to um, be here in Illinois. And train. Yeah. But, but, but let's look at the reality of it. You could make that argument for every category of discrimination. You could say, well, if we let, let you sue for gender discrimination, we'll drive businesses out. If we let you sue for racial discrimination, we'll drive businesses out. You could make that argument for every category. And, and so should we not have any discrimination laws because businesses will leave? All we're asking businesses to do is treat people with respect in the workplace. I don't think that's such a burden that it's going to send them fleeing to other states. Can I tell you why that's not true? For this reason. When we talk about gender discrimination, or there's a long history here. When we talk about uh, based on sex, there's a long history that led to these laws. When we start talking about bullying, now it becomes much more, if we're talking children, it's a different story. But in an adult workplace, uh, now there's a gray line. And the more gray, the line becomes, the more employers are getting charges and getting charges and being brought in. And particularly, some of these complaints are ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous, but it doesn't make any difference. They still have to come in, they still have to answer, they still have to get their documentation together. What is the workforce all about? There's many, many questions that have to be filled out, and the employer usually doesn't have that expertise they have to go out and hire an attorney to do it. And for a small business that's trying to get off the ground, I mean, I, it's not the equivalent to say anti-bullying is the same as let's not have racial discrimi discrimination. Two well, but we've, we've all heard about, and it's been more in the, the, the uh, non-adult, the minor situation where bullying has a significant psychological effect. Mm -hmm. And I don't see in some ways how that is different from sexual harassment or racial discrimination. And we, per, you know, personally, I wouldn't want businesses that, that do bully. Um, you want businesses that are progressive, that are enlightened, that are uh, thriving. And thriving people usually don't have to bully. Um, but now, to your point that a lot of the charges are ridiculous, mm -hmm. Danielle, do you see um, how many of the, the charges collectively um, would you say are not meritorious? You know, because I'm not with the Department of Human Rights, I don't do the charge processing. Uh, so I can't guesstimate what percentage uh, of charges end up resulting in finding a lack of substantial evidence. That would be the more right. technical okay. term for it. Um, but you know, part of the part of the reason why you're going to see more complaints, so you might see more frivolous complaints, is that we are a free, 
process or an open process. Is uh, there a it, filing? There's no there's filing? There's no filing fee. Okay. So anyone who feels they've been mistreated at work can go and file a charge. Uh, the good thing about the process is it does allow for both sides to come in and present their evidence and present their side so that hopefully uh, the frivolous complaints, the, the, the non-meritorious complaints can be weeded out uh, from the get-go. And is there someone that, that helps the person fill out the charge form and explains the process to the person if they don't have a lawyer? Right. I believe in the Department of Human Rights, they do have intake personnel. Okay. But you know, an important point about frivolous lawsuits in general or about fr frivolous claims, just because a claim gets dismissed doesn't mean it was frivolous. For example, if, if I was your boss and I called you into the office and I made inappropriate comments to you and you filed a complaint against me, how are you going to prove that? You have no witnesses, nothing in writing. So that case may get dismissed when it gets to a certain stage because you can't prove it. That doesn't mean it didn't happen and that doesn't make it frivolous just because it was dismissed. Well that's why the, the, commission, the um, uh, Human Rights uh, Department would ask for statistical evidence. They're not going to take the employer's word for it. Um, but it's, it just is wonderful that we have the act and that we have the process. I thank all of you so much for coming and um, I think this information has been very helpful to our audience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.